to worship at uh, Guelph Citadel. There we go. Now I have some volume and everybody can hear me, so that's perfect. Um, if you're visiting with us for the first time, we do extend a warm welcome to you and uh, want you to know that uh, uh, you are welcome here anytime. And uh, uh, we have a lot of ways that you can connect to life and fellowship here at uh, the Salvation Army Guelph Citadel. Uh, a lot of that information is in your bulletin that you would have received on the way in, uh, along with sermon notes that you can take with you um, that connect with... Uh, today's message and um, lots of save the date items in there lots of new things have been added to our save the date items um, for the spring uh, especially it's going to be a very busy spring so make sure you uh, take some time at your leisure to uh, review those save the date items and um, various celebrations and activities that are coming up in the springtime we'll be hosting a number of concerts here in the spring we will be celebrating our church's 140th anniversary this spring so you're going to want to be uh, aware of that date that is on april the 21st so more information will be flowing out about that in the uh, in the weeks to come and how you can uh, celebrate with us 140 years of uh, of god's faithfulness and uh, the faithfulness of the salvation army and salvationists over um over the years um in April. But lots of things going on and uh, of course regular weekly activities are slowly going to be um, restarting after the uh, holiday break. So stay tuned to your bulletin, um, our Facebook, um, Facebook page, our website guelphsa.ca uh, as information gets posted there. New Bible studies popping up and, and things like that. Um, and I'm going to highlight a couple of those just in a moment. But if you are, uh, if you are visiting with us or um, you're here for the first time, or you want to just connect with us, if you're a regular part of our church family, uh, guelphsa.ca slash connect. Uh, that QR code up on the screen um, is a way that you can uh, connect with us. You can uh, uh, ask questions. You can ask about how to get connected to uh, life and fellowship here. Um, you can submit prayer requests through that as well. Um, we're happy to receive those, and we'll be able to uh, connect with you during the week. Now, specific announcements uh, that are coming up in the immediate. This Wednesday at 2 o'clock, so that's January the 10th at 2 o'clock, the Seniors Club is meeting here at the church, and you will be uh, enjoying pool noodle games. Uh, this is not the first time that you guys have played pool noodle games because Major Leanne has a video on her phone of those who come to the Seniors Club playing pool noodle games. I think it was kind of a hockey, and, and they use pool noodles. It's a lot of fun. It's not dangerous. The noodles are soft, so that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, but that's this, this Wednesday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Come on out for the Seniors Club for pool noodle games. Then uh, the following week, the following Wednesday, January the 17th, our messy church on Wednesday night is starting up again. January the 17th at 6 o'clock, 6 till 7.30. Um, so you're welcome to come and, uh, and join us for that. That uh, Wednesday night messy church includes a meal together, a shared meal. It's a family-friendly evening of, of meal and uh, song and stories and games and crafts. Um, so if you're looking for something to do on Wednesday night, please come on out and, uh, and join us starting up on the 17th. Men's breakfast is happening on January the 20th at 8.30 a.m. at Stacked Pancake House. If you are uh, kind of a part of that regular group and you're already on the, the little email um, group for that, um, that's awesome. Please respond uh, to Morris. If uh, you're not on that group and you're interested in still attending that men's breakfast, Morris is uh, sitting under the balcony in the back. A little wave there, Morris, to the, everybody look under there behind the pillar. That's Morris. Catch him after the service and, uh, and he would be happy to uh, take your name for the men's fellowship breakfast. Um, we need to know in advance how many are coming so that we can book the right number of seats and get tables and stuff moved around so then the last uh, is a is a save the date um, but also for you to know that information is already available online our vacation bible school our march break vbs that happens uh, this year it's the 11th to the 15th of march uh, all of the registration information has gone live 
So you can go to guelphsa.ca slash VBS. If you are interested in, in uh, being a, uh, a leader, a volunteer leader or a helper, whether you're a youth or an adult helper, there are links on that page for you to connect. Uh, uh, you just go on that website, you'll see youth helper or youth leader, adult leader, you can click on that. And then there's also registration, online registration this year for VBS. And um, yeah, guelphsa.ca slash VBS, you'll find all of that information there. And over the coming weeks, there'll be lots more information about that event um, rolling out. So those are kind of the immediate announcements. I do want to let you folks know that if you um, were maybe away over the Christmas holidays and didn't check, um, we have a basket at the table just outside the main sanctuary doors here that has Christmas cards in it. So if you had been away and you didn't collect your Christmas cards, please check that basket. It's uh, divided up by name. Look for your name and, uh, and please take your Christmas cards home with you um, if you didn't get a chance to take those. And offering envelopes. If you haven't checked the table in the back for your annual offering envelopes, they are there as well. Um, please, following the service, uh, go on over there and uh, check out that table um, just, uh, just outside the fellowship hall there and you'll find all of those things there. I invite you to stand and we're going to share together in a responsive call to worship. The words will be up on the screen. We are starting a new sermon series today as we have come through a season of anticipation, a season of waiting. Uh, the Israelite people, uh, that's been a story of their life as they awaited um, the coming of the Messiah uh, as New Testament people um, saw that that coming had been fulfilled in Jesus and as we Christian people today um, seek to live as followers of Jesus the Messiah. We're going to be focusing for the next few weeks on the names of the Messiah. And so you're going to see that um, woven in through our service today, but we're going to begin with this responsive reading. Good news, unspeakable joy, a great light has burst forth, overcoming the darkness. A child is born for us, a son has been given bringing a kingdom of endless peace. We shall call him Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Come, let us see what God has brought us. Let us see what the Lord has done. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace and goodwill to all. Please remain standing as the, uh, the band helps us uh, in the singing of our opening song, The Light Has Come.
Would you join me in prayer? Holy One, you have appeared in the flesh, bringing redemption to all. Your glory is made known in the newborn child that we celebrated at Christmas, this living, blessed hope. And today we sing a new song, a song of justice, righteousness, and endless peace. Gift of God, beautiful Christ child, we welcome you. Let love be born anew in our hearts as we worship you today. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And we're going to sing another song as we, as we continue in this, this vein, this, this anticipation of, um, of course, throughout the Advent season, we awaited the coming of the Christ child. But when we applied to Jesus the title Messiah, um, it means that that waiting has come and gone. We're no longer waiting for him. We are living under his rule. So we sing this song together. Come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins release us, let us find our rest in thee. So we move from the anticipation of the Christ child to the acknowledgement of the Messiah as our redeemer, the one who brings salvation. Let's sing this together. Come thou Invite the children to make their way to Sunday school. Um, they can, uh, oh, no Sunday school today. Okay, no Sunday school today. Stay right where you are, kids, and, uh, and, and uh, you'll be joining us uh, and remaining with us in the service. Let's sing the, the second uh, and final verse together. invite the ushers to uh, make their way to the front as we prepare to worship God through the giving of our tithes and of our offerings and give back to him some of which he has blessed us with to support the work, his kingdom work, here in this community. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, you have given us your greatest gift, your very word come to earth to live with us and through us. You have filled us with your grace and truth, your holy child sent to free us from our bonds. How can we repay such divine generosity? So receive our thanks and our praise. As you have given to us, so now we share your gifts and your grace with a world in need. May this offering help bring your light and your love to those who still wander in darkness. Amen.
you have your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to turn to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9. If you're uh, wondering where Leanne is this morning, uh, our son Nate is heading back to, uh, back to Lindsay, back to college today, and uh, there's looking after a few things, but she took this past week um, while Nate was still home and Abby was off uh, as a week of holiday. So they're uh, worshiping at home together before Nate uh, takes off and heads back to school. Um, but we know that uh, she's with us in spirit today and uh, worshiping at home. Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah chapter 9, verses uh, 2 to 7. This is uh, often referred to as uh, the prophecy or the oracle of Isaiah, and it'll be the basis of our sermon series for the next four weeks. We've already declared the, the four titles uh, given to the Messiah in the song that we sang earlier. We're going to hear them again uh, in this passage of scripture. The words are on the screen as well uh, so that you can follow along. Isaiah chapter 9 verses 2 to 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So keep those words in mind as we, uh, as we sing together the song that the worship team is going to lead us in. What a beautiful name. And consider those names. Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Jesus Christ. 
wonderful, powerful name of Jesus, our Savior, our Redeemer, the one for whom there is no rival. We ask that you would speak to us through your word this morning as we come to your scriptures. Would you open our eyes and our ears to see and hear the message that you would have for us today as we consider these familiar words, words that have been part of um, perhaps uh, most church go- goers' awareness for as long as we can remember, and certainly words that have been part of the church since the beginning. Uh, enlighten us to who the Messiah is. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, the powerful name, the beautiful name, the wonderful name. In Romeo and Juliet, Shakespeare's uh, romantic tragic play uh, the love-struck montague asks the enchanting capulet what's in a name nothing defines us more in our lives than our name when we name a child we name them according to how we want to see the child in the future or maybe a name that we revere or a virtue that we cherish Names define us in ways that are deeply personal and meaningful right down to the core of our being. A couple of weeks, right up, right up until Christmas Day, we had, uh, and, and the week before that, we um, got to celebrate together and give thanks to God for, um, through the dedication of children, all who had been given names that, that imbued upon them special meaning, uh, whether it was connected to family or whether it was a virtue or a principle or a value. Uh, that parents wanted to ensure were entrusted to their children through their name. In Scripture, God sometimes gives a new name to somebody, indicating a new identity, um, a new promise, or a new purpose, like when Abram's name was changed to Abraham, or when Jacob's name was changed to Israel after wrestling with that angel, and and, and, um, Saul's name was changed to Paul, Simon was changed to Peter. In our passage of Scripture that we're going to be looking at today that, that, that kind of lays the foundation for the next few weeks, Israel was down to nothing. But God was up to something. It was a dark chapter in Israel's history. I hope you heard that in the words of, of, uh, of the prophet as he spoke about the war and the soldiers and the battles and the oppression and the rod of tyranny that was placed on Israel's back. Assyrian rule over Israel had been nothing short of devastating and oppressive. But God in his creative power was bringing about a new situation for his people. The people walking in darkness had seen a great light, the passage begins. A dramatic shift was about to take place from sorrow to joy, from slavery to freedom, from gloom to hope, all brought about by a newborn king who wasn't heavy-handed or oppressive. 
a child king would be born for us, for the people. And he would be a gift, a blessing, a light in the darkness. Now, it was common in the ancient world that when a king uh, ascended to his throne to be given additional names, and, and those names were throne names. And those throne names would describe the mission, the values, uh, and the flavor of the new king's rule. Throughout history, if you're a history buff, you'll be aware that, that kings and queens and leaders have been given nicknames to describe the personality or the style of their rule. And some of them are on the screen right here. We've got, uh, starting from the top left, we've got Ivan the Terrible of Russia. We've got Bloody Mary, Queen of England, or Queen of the Scots, depending on, on how you lean. We've got William the Bad of Sicily, Charles the Mad of France. Down on the bottom, Ragnar the Hairy Pants. If anybody watched the, uh, the Viking uh, movies, Ragnar Luffbrook, Luffbrook translates into, Brook is pants, or britches. Luffbrook, Ragnar the Hairy Pants, or the Hairy Britches. Alfonso the Slobberer, King of Leon. <laughs> and we've got Ivalo the Cabbage of, Bul of Bulgaria. <laughs> I don't know how many of those you've heard of, probably some of them. But the king that we're looking at this morning, and for, for the next four weeks, in fact, was a very different kind of king and had a very different name and a very different reputation and style of leadership from any of these rulers for sure. He's both principled and passionate. Two chapters before uh, what we read from Isaiah 9, um, the newborn king has already been given a throne name when Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And then here in Isaiah 9, each of the four titles, which are in two parts, are given to him. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, it's interesting that in, in, in some of the early commentaries and some of the early ways that the people were translating Scripture from, from Hebrew into other languages, uh, there was a, a translator who initially translated these with a comma in between each of those words. Wonderful. Counselor. So instead of four titles, there would be eight. But the original text combines them together into four distinct titles. Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. One of the questions in your sermon notes that you can consider in your own time is what difference would it make if there were a comma in between each of those two words? And then what difference does it mean to us to have them together uh, in the titles? This king from the lineage of David will be a totally different king of kings from all of the previous kings. He will succeed where all others had failed. He will be the Messiah, the Anointed One, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We're going to hear those words again. Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. For a child has been born to us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace. For the throne of David and his kingdom... He will, be a, he will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So with these words from the prophet Isaiah, we are transported back to the 8th century. The 8th century B.C. B.C.E. if you're an academic in present day. To the city of Jerusalem. And the atmosphere in Jerusalem is charged with anticipation, like the excitement that we might experience during the inauguration of a new leader. And we're familiar with these words from Isaiah's oracle, found in verses 2 to 7, partly because um, of classical music, Handel's Messiah in particular. We hear these. Sometimes, some of you might have that on your rotation uh, leading up to Christmas, Handel's Messiah, right? For unto us a child is born, right? And, and, and the, the words are very familiar if you're listening to it in the English. But while the oracle did not anticipate or predict Jesus, and I want you to hear that correctly, 
Isaiah's words did not predict Jesus. While they didn't predict Jesus, there is no doubt that in Isaiah's own time, this passage would have been used to announce and celebrate the birth of a new royal prince in Jerusalem. Most commentators speculate that it would have been Hezekiah, or at least the crowning of a new king. And the coronation of a new king in Jerusalem at this time was an occasion for anticipation. The anticipation of a new wave of well-being, a new wave of peace and prosperity for Israel. Isaiah's oracle paints a vivid picture of hope amidst the shadow of imperial oppression under Assyrian rule. It's a scene promising a great light and endless peace in stark contrast to the everyday experience of Israel at that time, which would have been akin to prevailing darkness. And it's not until the New Testament that the early Christian communities would begin to see these Old Testament hopes for a child who would establish a righteous kingdom fulfilled in Jesus Christ as Messiah. So I've already said our focus over the next four weeks, the next four Sundays, will be to consider the four royal titles that are assigned to this new king in verse 6. And as we explore the significance of the first name or title, Wonderful Counselor, we're invited to contemplate what that means. What are the implications of having a leader endowed with exceptional wisdom and foresight? Picture it. Picture a ruler whose decisions surpass the ordinary, guiding a nation with an unprecedented level of insight. I mean, more often than not now, when a new leader is inaugurated, we spend much of their reign or their time in leadership complaining about their lack of foresight, <laughs> complaining about how, how horribly they lead their people. The term counselor extends beyond merely offering advice. It refers to the exercise of governance. This leader that Isaiah is foretelling possesses a unique capacity to administer, to plan, to execute policies. And God is being praised for assigning a king who is expected to devise plans and policies for the benefit of the entire realm. For all people. Now the adjective wonderful hints at a wisdom that transcends, transcends expectation. Whether the king's exceptional insight or uh, the remarkable quality of the policies that they implement, they are wonderful, wonderful leaders. The anticipation then that we hear in Isaiah's oracle is that this new king's governance will not only be effective, but will also bring about practical benefits that leave the subjects in awe. We don't declare something wonderful unless we've found a certain amount of, 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 of awesomeness, of inspiration in whatever it is that we're declaring wonderful. So imagine a leader whose plans and policies surpass the conventional norms of political power, promising a reign marked by excellence and advantages, practical advantages for the people. That is the world in which these words come into existence. Isaiah's prophecy is not speaking about Jesus, but is about speaking about a leader who will come to lead Israel, lead them out of Assyrian oppression, bring about practical benefit and, and, and increase and improve the well-being. Peace and righteousness will be part of their reign. Now fast forward to the time Jesus, and we find ourselves in the midst of a clash between the anticipated Messiah and the mighty Roman Empire. We've gone from Assyria holding a rod of oppression over Israel to Rome holding a rod of oppression over Israel. And it's not just a historical narrative. It is a saga of political tension and subversion. The Roman Empire with its 
coercive military might and its oppressive taxation system. We see that throughout the Gospels, right? Every time we hear about a tax collector, it's, oh, bad tax collector, right? That was a part of Rome's oppressive regime. Well, this casts a shadow over the entire land. And into this context, Jesus emerges as the long-awaited king, challenging the very foundation of imperial power. Consider the scene in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, where the gospel places the birth of Jesus in the midst of the power and command of Rome. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all of the world should be registered. This was the first registration that was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to their own towns to be registered. The proclamation that we hear in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near, sets the stage for a clash between the divine kingdom and the earthly empire. The gospel unfolds as a dramatic confrontation between King Jesus and the entrenched power of Rome. And as we explore the role of this new king, the role of this Messiah, we're left to consider how it is that Jesus is the anticipated wonderful counselor and what that title means for good news in the world. And we need only look at the familiar birth story in Luke chapter 2 to see that Jesus demonstrates wise counsel. In Luke 2, verses 40, and then again in 52, the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. And then in verse 52, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And he is extraordinarily wonderful in his, in his teaching because he exhibited an authority that was unlike the authority of the scribes who were the most learned of his contemporaries. In Luke 2, 47 to 48, everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, this is Jesus teaching in the temple, they were astonished. His wisdom, evident from a young age, challenges conventional scribes with teachings that open up new possibilities and new ways of thinking about the kingdom. The parables that he shares, the good Samaritan, the prodigal son, they disrupt the common practices, introducing a world governed by principles that challenge the status quo. It was okay for you to walk to the other side of the road when you saw somebody injured because the status quo, the culture of the time, permitted you to do that. But Jesus turns these things on their head. He shattered the societal limits, revealing them as barriers to keeping the marginalized down. And he performed. He didn't just teach the seemingly impossible. He performed the seemingly impossible, healing the sick and raising the dead and standing up for those pushed to the sidelines. So this isn't just an ancient tale. It's a contemporary challenge for you and for me today. When Jesus said, blessed is anyone who doesn't get offended by me in Luke chapter 7, he essentially proclaimed, you're in for something amazing if you don't let my actions unsettle you. You're in for something amazing if you don't let my actions unsettle you. It's a call for us to scrutinize the the unfair rules that society imposes and to stand up and declare no more, no more. Today it's about breaking free from the limits, restraining those who have been held back, and advocating for a world where everyone gets a fair shot. And Jesus' message still resounds today, friends, urging us to stand against the forces that hinder progress and make it seemingly impossible, this an impossible reality for all people. In essence, Jesus smashed through fake limits transforming the impossible into a possibility for everyone. His actions, whether healing the sick or raising the dead, they go beyond rational explanation. We can't explain those kinds of things away. We simply chalk it up as, as, as his divine power. 
but they display an inexplicable wisdom. His capacity for the impossible poses an immediate threat to the established power arrangements, prompting the authorities to take counsel on how to suppress Jesus. How do we get rid of him? He's stirring up the common folk. How do we put a stop to it? Because in essence, Jesus becomes a ruler of the impossible, inviting his followers to continue his subversive mission in a world that is desperately in need of transformative change. So recognizing Jesus as the new king isn't merely a festive acknowledgement. I mean, we came through the Christmas season and it was very festive and there was lots of celebrating. But it's a new vocation. It's a new vocation. It's about us saying, so Christmas has happened, now what? Now what? It's not only an acknowledgement of his rule in the world, but it's a recruitment for action consistent with his new regime. Walter Brueggemann explains it like this. The increase of his government will not be by supernatural imposition or by royal decree. It will come about through the daily intentional engagement of his subjects who are so astonished by his wonder that they no longer subscribe to the old order of power and truth that turns out to be, in the long run, only debilitating fraudulence. To use the language that I hear uh, used often today by younger people than I, the old way is a dupe. The old way is a dupe. It's fake. It's a knockoff. This happened with Christmas lists this year with our youngest, right? Oh, Dad, you can't get those. Those are knock. Those are dupes. I don't want those dupes. Those, those Nike socks, the white Nike tube socks that for some reason a lot of <laughs> young people want. Um, they were sold out almost everywhere. But you could find them online, but fake ones. They were dupes. The old way, the old status quo, the world of oppression, the world of taking advantage is a fraudulent world. It's not God's design. It's not the realm that Jesus kind of broke through to bring into being in his kingdom. In a world often entrenched in fraudulent and oppressive practices, it takes uncommon wisdom to interrupt the foolishness of the status quo. So the challenge for us is to consider how we too can contribute to a world marked by principles of endless peace and justice. As followers of the wonderful counselor, may we be agents of wisdom and change. May we actively participate in the governance of love and compassion and justice in our community. And may we draw inspiration from Jesus' example. As we engage with one another, may we seek to break down barriers, challenging unfair systems, and advocate for the well-being of all. Because the wonderful counselor calls us to be architects of positive change, to be influencers in our world, and ambassadors of hope in a world hungry for wise governance. The worship team is going to come and, and, and lead us in just a, a, a quiet moment of reflection uh, with the song, Your Name. And the words of it uh, in the second verse declare the following, Jesus, in your name we pray. Come and fill our hearts today. Lord, give us strength to live for you and glorify your name. That is what the wonderful counselor calls us to. Calls us to offer our very lives over to him so that we might be filled with his wisdom, that we might be filled with his presence, that he might give us strength to live for him every day. So may the wisdom of the wonderful counselor guide us and inspire us and empower us to bring light and peace into the places 
where they are desperately needed. In your sermon notes, there are uh, questions for reflection. We encourage you to use those in your own devotional time or get together with, uh, get together with a few people and, um, and work through them during, during the week following, following each message. And uh, one of the questions uh, that are asked is, as a disciple of Christ, how can you carry out this task of following Jesus into the world and threatening the established culture of the day, the, the culture that seeks to be uh, uh, oppressive and harsh towards other people. How can you carry out the task of, of living like Jesus and being light and peace and hope and love in the world? We are still people walking. We are still people in the dark, and the darkness looms around us, beset as we are by fear, anxiety, brutality, violence, loss, a dozen alienations that we cannot manage. We are, we could be, people of light. And so we pray. We pray, God, for the light of your glorious presence. We pray for the light of your wondrous grace. We pray for your gift of newness. We pray that we may see and know and hear and trust in your good rule. That we may have energy, courage, and freedom to enact your rule through the demands of this day. We submit all of our days to you and to your rule with deep joy and high hope. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand as we... Uh, move into the closing moments of our service, and we're going to sing with the help of the band a song, uh, again, reminding us that that light came out of darkness into a world where there was no light and no hope.
But Jesus came. Jesus came to live among us, and he brought that hope, and he brought that light uh, so that we might experience God's love in that way, and we might also share that. So let's sing together three verses straight through with the help of the band. When the carols have been stilled, when the star-topped tree is taken down, when family and friends are gone home, when we are back to our schedules, the work of Christmas begins. To welcome the refugee, to heal a broken planet, to feed the hungry, to build bridges of trust, not walls of fear, to share our gifts, to seek justice and peace for all people, to bring Christ's light to the world. Go now in the light of Christ to be light unto the world. God bless you.
redeeming what was lost and all that could have been. Oh, this is a healing kind of love. You are the truest friend. Staying through the night when I was at my end. Comforting my heart till it was light again. Oh, this is a faithful kind of love. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and then you will God with us till here with me. Wonderful Counselor, the government is resting on Oh, this is a steady kind.